Today's lecture covers Etruscan art. We're going to learn all about the art and architecture of the first peoples of Italy. The Etruscans occupied a region in Italy which we call Tuscany, right under the Tuscan sun. And the Etruscans are the first peoples of Italy basically before the Romans were Roman, right? And we've learned a little bit about the Etruscans. We know that they have been trading with the ancient Greece uh, world. The Etruscans also traded with the Chinese on the Silk Road trade routes to the Far East. So they had a lot of you know, various trade connections. Uh, one important aspect about um, the Etruscan sites is we're going to take a look at a lot of their funerary art, especially at um, Cerveteri and Chiuzzi. Um, we're going to look at some really great examples um, of funerary art and the way that they um, perform rituals, you know, with the dead. Um, the uh, ancient site of Arezzo, um, we're going to see some beautiful sculptures that are unearthed uh, from that region. Um, the Etruscans definitely, when it comes to their architecture, are revered. Uh, when it comes to the materials that they use, they favor terracotta, sun-baked clay. Of course, this is Tuscany after all, so you've got um, lots of clay and lots of sun, uh, sunshine there. So uh, one thing that's important to recognize with Etruscan art is that the timeline is similar to ancient Greece. So we have, you know, a, a geometric period, an archaic period, and so on. Uh, eventually, of course, the Etruscans will be absorbed into um, the, the Roman culture. But we do sort of start off seeing some similar influences that we had seen uh, with the um, ancient Greeks uh, world. Okay, well, we know the geographic area of the Etruscan people is Tuscany in uh, what is present-day Italy. We are definitely going to be looking at some of the origins, right, of Etruscan art and culture. We know I mentioned some of the influence from um, the Far East uh, with the trade routes. So we are going to see kind of an Eastern influence coming in uh, as well. Uh, examining religious and mythological similarities between the Etruscans, the Romans, and the Greeks. So actually... All three of these civilizations, they all had very similar, you know, gods and goddesses, basically nature deities. They were polytheistic societies. Um, they just had different names for the same gods, if that makes sense. Um, so if, if an Etruscan sort of came across a, a Greek um, a trader on the trade route and they were both talking about Apollo, um, the sun god, uh, the Etruscan might refer to Apollo as Apulu, and the Greek might say, you know, Apollo, right? So at, at the core of it, at the crux of it, each, each person would have understood the meaning, right, of who that god is and what they represent, right? Um, they just might have had a, a you know, various different dialect, different name for the, for the god. But that the core uh, belief, the core mythology is very interconnected. Uh, we're going to examine a lot of the different orientalized designs of Etruscan jewelry. Etruscans were renowned when it came to metalsmithing. And in fact, today, um, the people in Italy today, um, they study still the ancient Etruscan methods when it comes to jewelry making. Um, so small-scale you know, uh, jewelry, metalsmithing, uh, uh, very fine um, uh, metalwork. Uh, this is really um, uh, revered when it comes to Etruscan art, especially when it comes to smaller, uh, intimate, more personalized items. So let's take a look at one of these items. It's uh, a fibula with orientalizing lions from the Rigellini Galassi tomb in Cerveteri in Italy. And it's a fibula. Now, a fibula just means a, a decorative pin. Um, so fibula would have been worn actually um, on the chest um, uh, to hold the garment up at the shoulder. Now this one is quite large. I mean, it's almost a foot big, right? Um, so you, know, you can kind of get the sense here the, of the photo from the Vatican of it. This is a scale is a little strange in the, in the 
perspective of the photo, but that particular piece would cover the, the chest, basically pinning up the garment at the shoulder. Um, oftentimes there might be a pair of fibula, right? Maybe a matching pair, one on either side. Oftentimes there might just be one. Um, in this case, it's one decorative piece. Um, and we see what's really striking about it is that we have these orientalizing lions. Now the lion motif we've seen, of course, in, um, in uh, you know, African and Egyptian art. We've seen it in Mesopotamian, you know, with ancient Near East art. And uh, although we haven't learned about um, Chinese art yet, um, definitely the, the uh, lion is a prevalent uh, symbol in um, Chinese you know, culture. So we've got this uh, element of the all-powerful all lion, um, and we have a couple different styles or techniques here. We have the repoussé, the hammered relief technique to create the actual shape of the overall form. There is, uh, there are elements of, um, you know, filigree where you have um, uh, more detailed uh, methods uh, of applying more texture to the surface of the uh, fibula here. You can see quite a bit of uh, pattern, you know, geometric pattern coming in, some floral motifs coming in. All right, uh, so in funerary art, this is a bronze bed and carriage. This would have been um, basically a carriage that would be used to, um, to uh, display the body, uh, the ancestral remains of um, the lost loved one through a funerary procession um, to, the, to the graveyard. Um, so the actual carriage itself um, what's fascinating about it is that a large portion of it is actually made out of metal, right? Out of bronze. And there would have been a wooden core. Now, of course, historians have made sure to, um, to recreate the wood since it obviously had rotted. But when they found it and they excavated it, the, um, the, actual site would have been uh, very immaculate because you would have been able to actually see the, the actual metal. You would see where the wood was rotted. They make sure to do really great field notes, even sometimes often you know, pouring in molds to get casts of the exact shapes of, of um, these pieces of wood that might be rotting. Um, so in their actual reproduction, they've done a fine job of displaying the actual uh, uh, metal um, that the metal smithing techniques that would have been used to decorate such an elaborate scene. Now, a few years back, uh, we actually went to the town of Arezzo, and I signed up for a uh, Etruscan jewelry making class, um, believe it or not. I took a bunch of art history classes when I was there, and this was one of the studio classes that I signed up for. Um, so I actually learned from Master Guido Sisti. And Master Guido Sisti is one of the most well-known of the uh, metalsmiths today in the town of Arezzo. And uh, in fact, fun fact about Master Guido Sisti, his work has actually been flown to outer space in a time capsule, which is kind of amazing um, to think about. But he, uh, he actually, uh, learned all of the ancient Etruscan techniques. He hand forges all of his own tools. So all of his hammers and uh, all of these iron tools here that you see, he hand forges all of them. So every part of the process is completely built from the ground up. Um, you can see that over here, I'm doing some, some hammering, some repoussé there, and also some repoussé there, you can see. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a very tedious technique, and you can see, um, you know, we're having quite a bit of fun. This was my design with a, with a uh, fleur-de-lis style design there. Okay, so uh, earlier we were talking about the um, mythological gods and goddesses of the Etruscan world. So this is a great chart because it shows you the kind of the counterparts from the Greco-Roman gods and goddesses. So we have, um, you know, the 
Greek god Zeus, for instance. Of course, the Romans called Zeus Jupiter. Um, and in the Etruscan world, it was Tinea. Okay, same god, you know, the Zeus, the, you know, the, the god on Mount Olympus, the god of all the gods there. Um, and then, of course, we have Hera is Uni, Athena is Minerva, Apollo is Apulu, Artemis is Artemis, and Hercules is Hercule. <laughs> so, very similar um, uh, mythological deities, just maybe the name changes occasionally from here and there. All right, so Etruscan architecture, we definitely want to understand the difference um, and the similarities between Etruscan temples and Greek temples. That is a very important question we want to get into and analyze. And we are going to look at various examples of their materials, how their columns are structured, how it's spaced, the function, and the actual placement of temples. And how was it was it that Etruscans worshipped versus how was it that the Greeks worshipped? So in the case of a typical Etruscan temple, um, this is a, a, a facsimile of a temple as described by the Roman architect Vitruvius later. The reason why we look to Vitruvius's writings about Etruscan temples is that quite simply Etruscan temples Many of them do not still stand today the way that we would see a, a, a marble temple uh, from the ancient Greek world standing uh, because it's made out of wood and it's made out of mud brick. So more likely to deteriorate, more likely to, um, to uh, not stand like the marble and the stone does over, over time. But we know where the sites were located because the foundation of the temples is uh, made in the, uh, the tufa, the, the local limestone. Uh, and so we can see the post holes. We know exactly where that would have been. Vitruvius, of course, had very detailed writings um, about you know, observing the Etruscan temples while they were still standing later in the Roman world. So we have a really great idea of what they would have looked like structurally. And what we know is that the columns were not completely around the whole perimeter, the way that we, we see in the classical Greek world. They actually were mainly on the portico, on the porch. The temples actually, like most temples in the Etruscan world, were structured to east to west, right? The sun rises in the east and sets in the west, so they are aligned with the sun. But the porch is um, the most important point. Now, interesting enough, we know that Etruscan worshipers did not go inside the temple to worship. In fact, they stood outside the temple to worship. Um, very similar uh, situation there in the ancient Greek world. Only usually important people, priests, people performing rituals went inside the cella or the sanctuary where the um, the cult statues housed uh, in the inner space. So most worshipers generally are on the outside staring up at the temple. And in this case, they're not all the way around the temple. They're just in the front, right, in the trust world since we're looking at the portico. Now, very important concept here. Where are the statues, the cult statues located in the Etruscan temple? Well, they are on the roof. So in the Greek world, the cult statue was housed in the cella, in the interior of the temple. In the Etruscan world, the cult statues are on the roof, okay? And of course we know mud brick, terracotta versus something like marble in the Greek world. These are just a few similarities or differences. Okay, Etruscan sculptures. We're gonna look at some examples of um, the Etruscan Apollo sculpture from the sarcophagus, from Cervetary, and we're gonna look at the sarcophagus of Cervetary also as well, both two separate things. Uh, how are both objects unique in terms of their materials, their poses, and their social commentary? We're gonna get into that, and we're gonna also learn a little bit more about the role of women in Etruscan society as well. 
Okay, so with uh, Apulu, uh, we've got Apollo here. This would have been one of the uh, uh, large-scale terracotta statues, about life-size here, that would have been on the actual roof of uh, the uh, Porta Nocchio Temple in the town of Vene in Italy. Um, and so we, you can imagine it hovering right on the roof of the temple. Now the, the roof itself would have had terracotta tiles, so the actual terracotta, the coloring of it, it's that sort of warm reddish, you know, beautiful um, clay, uh, would have just had a, a beautiful harmony with the actual architecture of the, of the roof tiles. And you can see here that he looks very similar to Greek, archaic statuary in the face, right? There, he has sort of an archaic smile uh, uh, expression on his face um, and the way his sort of nose is sort of growing out of his forehead there. It, there are some similarities to some of the archaic Greek statues we had been learning about. But take note of the stylization right up the drapery here. We see a kind of a schematic pattern with repetition. And he is taking a step forward. He is in motion. I mean, he has kind of the, uh, the feeling of a god, right? That he is sort of emerging uh, from, from uh, uh, the space um, with a, a sense of power and a sense of grace uh, in the image. And you can see also how the um, Etruscan artist have sort of incorporated some of the um, architecture of a very decorative post that has some scroll-like or volute uh, shape to it that kind of mimics some of the, you know, ripples in the drapery folds there. And the sarcophagus with the reclining couple from Chevetteri, this is a great example of funerary art, and it, it also showcases the importance of a uh, woman woman in the Etruscan world. Now, what we're looking at is a couple, a man and a woman. They are reclining on a cline, a funerary bed, and they are somewhat embrace, either embracing one another. They each are sort of making different hand gestures. It is believed that they more than likely were probably holding little decorative eggs. Um, eggs are a symbol of fertility, of course, and the idea that they are posing, right, their hands, it's a very important concept because when you think about the Italians, you know, even today, if maybe you yourself are Italian or maybe you have friends who are Italian, and when Italians speak, right, they gesticulate with their hands. They're always, you know, really describing things with their hands, right? And so it makes sense, right, that we see these first peoples of Italy um, poignantly displaying or holding an object such as an egg that would be a symbol of fertility in, in such a meaningful, you know, uh, poignant way, right? And we see the man and the woman together. Now, this is very different than some of the work that we had seen, especially with funerary art in the Greek world. We had learned that men and women sort of lived in separate worlds. Um, it would be very rare that we would see that a man and a woman together in a scene uh, uh, participating in the same activity. In the Etruscan world, um, the Etruscan men actually um, participated in rituals with the women. And, you know, I know today you think, well, gosh, well, why not, right? That, that doesn't seem so weird. But in the ancient world, again, men and women inhabited different worlds, okay? And so it is fascinating because actually other civilizations like the Greeks criticized the Etruscans. In fact, they called the, the women of the Etruscan world audacious. They said, oh, you know, the, the audacity of the Etruscan woman, right? Um, but again, going back to thinking about, you know, if you have friends or family who are Italian or maybe you're, you, know, you, you yourself are Italian, you know how important the matriarchal figure is, how important the mama is, right, in the family. Um, and so the Etruscans, you know, held women up to, to, a, to, a, to a certain place, right? Um, and they revered them and they gave them 
power. They gave them status and they gave them recognition in, in, in uh, sharing, the, occupying the same space, right, as uh, a male figure. Um, so we get the sense of the intimacy between the two. We get the sense of how important the woman is in the scene. And it is a sarcophagus, right? And sarcophagi means flesh eater. So this is obviously a vessel where the body would go inside. Now we do know that the Etruscans, they also um, cremated their dead as well. We do have examples of um, some uh, funerary urns as well uh, from the period. But what really is phenomenal for us to look at are the actual tombs themselves. Uh, from the necropolis here at Cerveteri. Now, of course, the necropolis is a city of the dead, and uh, the Etruscan tombs are carved, uh, really structured, uh, sculpted from the local tufa, the, the local uh, limestone, the local bedrock. And then they have these uh, thatched roofs. Um, so inside of these tombs, you might find various sarcophagi or even uh, funerary urns of various family members. And inside of these tombs, the tumults, uh, you would see the um, structuring to be more like how you would be inside of somebody's home, right? So you might see, right, some funerary beds, some chairs, um, the idea of being in an interior sort of domesticated scene, right? And this would be so important because if you went back to visit, you know, your loved one, your ancestor, um, you would walk inside the tomb and you, know, you would feel like you, uh, you know, were, were in, a, in an intimate space with them and in, back at home with them, for instance. Um, so it had an interesting uh, interior design concept here, making it look like the interior of a house. Uh, very fascinating. Here's a good example of the Etruscan hut urn I was talking about earlier. Um, this one, I love this one, the Tomb of the Reliefs. Um, this is an interior from uh, another tomb at, at Chavetri where you can actually see that the artist has gone to great detail to showcase, of course, yes, um, you know, furniture, but every single little object like water pitcher, rope, um, you know, garden tools, uh, you know, shields, uh, just about anything that one might use, right, uh, for maybe something for the fire pit over there. So they'd actually cre created sort of a faux still life, if you will, of every object that would be hanging on the wall. Um, interesting enough, there are images of mythological creatures in the scene. For instance, there's, um, the three-headed dog Cerberus, who you know guards the gates of Hades down there. Um, so we have an interesting combination of uh, imagery from the land of the living and imagery from um, you know a, 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 the afterlife or from mythology, and it's sort of blending together and the inside of this tumult. <laughs> Okay, uh, interesting classical and Hellenistic period. So uh, we're definitely gonna be looking at more of the funerary customs and we are going to examine some later Etruscan art in terms of the materials and the subject matter. And especially in the later period, it is going to be important because of the result of being conquered, right, by really the Romans. They get they get absorbed into Greek culture and then fully absorbed into Roman culture. So the Etruscans essentially just sort of phase out and sort of blend into Roman world, right? They become Romanized. Um, so we'll see that transition. The Etruscan tombs and the funerary art. So let's take a closer look here at some of the wall painting. Okay, so we know that in Italy, the uh, preferred method here is gonna be the blonde fresco, the wet fresco. And we're looking at the interior of the Tomb of the Lepers, of course, named after this uh, lovely um, uh, design here with the spotted leopards at, at the top of the roof there. 
And we can see that the artists here are using, you know, red and yellow ochres. We have some lapis lazuli blue. We have such a rich, vivid um, feeling of color and pattern throughout. And we see that the um, design showcases, again, uh, figures who are displaying small little, you know, uh, eggs. We can see the men and the women are together. And we have um, them reclining, but then they're also sort of set against this backdrop of almost a landscape that looks almost like an olive tree. In fact, if we look at the double flute player a little more closely, we can see what really does look like an olive tree um, with the little bitty black olives and the actual sort of color and the shape of the, um, the olive leaf itself. And again, look at the hand gestures. Look at the way he is gesticulating. He's playing the flute and his hands are bigger than his head, right? And to you know, play the double flute, one has to be very dexterous. <laughs> so also take a look at how extra large his feet are and his um, leather sandal, the pattern and the decoration there. Um, we've got just a very robust sense of design. All right, so we've seen similar uh, images of these divers taking the plunge into the afterlife um, when we were looking at ancient Greece. Uh, so here in the Etruscan world, something similar, right? A similar concept of taking the plunge, right? From life into the afterlife. Uh, we've got a diving and fishing scene. You know, it's very abundant here. You can see fishermen, you can see the, the birds, the sky and the you know another another diver is sort of coming up the rear here and I guess he's going to jump off next. Um, very stylized but we can see the integration of the figure within the landscape and this is a very important concept because after all this is Tuscany right a, a beautiful region very fertile we know that in the tradition of Italian art, just you know, as we continue to move forward through, through the Renaissance up until now, incorporating elements of landscape are incredibly uh, foundational you know, to, to Italian art. So seeing how the first Italian artist did this is very, um, very eye-opening. Eye All right, classical and Roman Etruscan art. Now we're sort of starting to approach this period where we start to see more influence from a Roman uh, culture, right? And, and also the Greek, the Greek culture. Um, and why does this happen? Well, of course, as the Romans start to gain more and more power, we know eventually the Romans will conquer the Greek world. So the Romans then, of course, just absorb it, anything that's left of the Etruscan, the Etruscan world. So the Etruscan kings were faced with a unique challenge um, that essentially when the Romans and the Roman warriors showed up to the gates of their city, the Romans basically said, become, become Roman or die. <laughs> so, you know, of course, some of the earlier Etruscan kings um, maybe tried to fight a battle. Of course, they would have lost. Uh, but the later Etruscan kings, any city that still was standing, they essentially just said, okay, yeah, spare our city and we'll become Roman. And that's really what happens. Um, the, the legend of the Capitoline Wolf is very important when we're talking about Roman culture, but also this particular piece is very controversial. Uh, since it is still in the Etruscan chapter, it is believed that the um, the Capulet Wolf itself here is, um, you know, created during the Etruscan period. However, there is a lot of information that is out there that says differently, and. So it is still up for debate. It's still an ongoing big battle in the art world. Um, 
And here's the real reason why it is so controversial. Now, of course, the wolf itself is what we're talking about. Um, let me just preface it by saying that the babies that are Romulus and Remus, the brothers Romulus and Remus, these were additions that were added during the, rent, the uh, uh, Renaissance, the 15th century additions. So these we know, these are Renaissance babies. They, they are not from, from the Etruscan period. But what we're actually talking about here is the actual Capuline wolf itself as being questionable whether it being Etruscan or it being dated to a later period. Now, here's why it's so important. Because the story of the Capuline wolf is the story of Romulus and Remus, which is the story about the founding of Rome. Okay, so any origin story, right, that's the foundation of your whole narrative, right? And so if the Capuline Wolf is sculpted in Etruscan times, it literally is telling the story at the beginning, right? But if this is sculpted later, like what's presumed, you know, the, the, the hypothesis that's been put forward and the evidence that's been put forward, that it's later from a medieval time, then that's looking at it back after the fact and then creating the narrative, right? Uh, so it doesn't have the, um, the, the, the weight that it would have if it wasn't a trusted statue. Now, why is it so controversial? Well, for, for the longest time, it's been attributed to the trusted world. But recent thermoluminescence dating uh, evidence suggests that these could be from the med medieval Carolingian period, so more from the 13th century. And what um, thermoluminescence dating is, is that thermoluminescence is actually used in dating um, meteors um, in, in the geological world. Um, and what it tells you is the last time a substance was heated at an incredibly high temperature. So, um, in the case of, you know, a meteor, you know, uh, falling from the atmosphere, uh, or things like this, rocks in general, things that have gone through, that have been heated, whether it be through lava, or gone through the churning of, you know, different processes in the earth. I mean, this thermoluminescence dating t tells you this information. So, historians have done tests on this that say that, hey, this might actually the last time it was heated at such a high temperature might have actually been a, at a much later period. So you can see that that becomes very controversial that um, there are people out there that need to preserve, you know, this being Etruscan. There are people out there that say we have evidence that says otherwise. So this happens in art. This happens in art history, especially where um, you see challenging and opposing forces and ideas and so where do you get to that, where do you get to that 100% place, right, A fact? Um, what is the Capuline Wolf doing? What is so important about it? Well, of course, you have two brothers, Romulus and Remus. And like most brothers, they were siblings and they had a rivalry and they quarreled all the time. And one day, Romulus kills Remus and he becomes the founder of Rome. He becomes the first king of Rome. And this is uh, interesting because when they were children, the Capuline wolf actually raised them. They were uh, wild children, you know, they were sort of raising themselves. And so in this particular scene, she's sort of protecting them right there, literally suckling milk from her nipples. And she's sort of guarded, you know, sort of watching them. This is it. Um, it's actually housed at the Capitoline Museum there in Rome. Hey, definitely from an Etruscan workshop is the Chimera of Arezzo. Now this 100% uh, has been attributed to an Etruscan workshop. It actually has an Etruscan inscription on the actual statue. And it's a great example of the Etruscan um, uh, lost wax, uh, bronze, 
technique. And what we're looking at, folks, is a chimera, an ancient mythological beast that has um, lion aspects with a serpent tail and a goat that grows out of one side of its body. And like most mythological monsters, it's got to have, you know, uh, uh, the blood of a virgin and it's just a ravenous beast. And the story of the Chimera of Arezzo is very unique because um, the town of Arezzo, they were terrified of this thing. You know, of course, it would come out at night and eat everybody. And so the, um, the Etruscan king said, well, we have to bring a hero in to slay the Chimera. So the only person they could think of who was sort of vicious enough to do it was this guy named Bellerophon. And Bellerophon, he was kind of a rogue guy. He had actually been exiled uh, from the town uh, previously. But they knew that they needed somebody like him to slay the Chimera. So in the story, Bellerophon comes back and he kills the Chimera and it's a story of redemption, really. Um, the way he slays the Chimera um, is that he has you know, the winged horse here, Pegasus, and he's got a giant spear made of lead. And what happens is the Chimera, it's, it, it is a, a fire-breathing creature. And so this is one reason why people couldn't kill it, because if they get close enough, they would just be singed alive. So Bellerophon uh, knew and it was going to be very strategic. And right when the Chimera is going to push out its flames, he's going to throw the spear into his throat. And that heat from the flame will melt the lead and then just, you know, basically clog up the throat of the Chimera. And that's exactly what happens here. The actual inscription uh, on the um, arm of the Chimera translates uh, to a gift to Tinia. Now, if you remember, Tinia is the Etruscan equivalent of um, the Greek god Zeus, right, and the Roman god uh, Jupiter. So this is a gift to the gods. Um, the uh, artisan made this uh, as a gift to the gods um, and uh, potentially asking right for a favor in return, like, will you please protect us from the Chimera, right? Um, it is housed at the um, museum, actually, in Arezzo. Um, this tells a little more about the story I just told you already. And then this this image, Bellerophon on Pegasus, fearing the Chimera, it's actually an interesting shape. Um, what we're looking at is the, the, the butt end of the uh, epentron, which on its side looks like this. The epentron is what women who um, were spinning uh, thread on, on wheels, people who were um, fiber artists, they would wear it on their leg, on their knee, while spinning. So the actual shape of the the vessel is kind of kind of unique because it fits the thigh sort of. Um, but on the again on the front end of it is this this scene right here. And it just makes me it makes me imagine you know uh, women sitting around spinning making making fiber art and just they're all talking to one another and telling mythological stories and you know. Um, it reminds me, like, like with quilting or knitting circles, right? There's something interesting about that to me when I when I look at the functionality of the object versus like what the mythological narrative is. It's storytelling time, right? I think it's interesting. Okay, how about we just continue to move along here? Let's look at the gates of Mars. So the gates of Mars are important because. The gates to the city in Perugia were spared uh, because the Etruscan kings submitted to the Roman warriors. Um, so, 
the gates of Mars, of course, Mars is the god of war. Uh, so we have Mars, um, and we have um, an Etruscan gate now that it, it, where we're seeing elements or fusions of Roman Roman elements kind of coming in uh, to it. But it is mainly rare because it is a gate to a city that still exists. It was not burned down because the Etruscans submitted to the Romans. Okay. The sarcophagus of Lars Pulina. So Lars Pulina, the tradition of, of including your lifetime achievements on a sarcophagus really begins here. Lars Polina has a scroll that is sort of unfurling in front of him, you know, as he's sort of cur like, curvilinearly reclining here on his sarcophagi. And inscribed on it lists all of his life's accomplishments, <laughs> you know. And um, the Etruscan funerary art, the way that these sarcophagi were made, is that artists might make a simplified sort of basic design and then when somebody's loved one dies that person might then go to the artisan and then commission right the, the for this sarcophagi to be more personalized right so then they might say oh well you know my my loved one good old Lars here he did this and this and this and this and we're going to add it to the list and make sure you get his eyes just right, you know, when you carve them. And so, you know, there are these rooms, you know, room for personalized touches like this. And just in the trajectory of kind of where we're headed, you know, when we start to get into uh, Roman art, we're going to see that the tradition uh, and the investment that goes into uh, personalizing sarcophagi is going to be so important. And so, you know, getting this sense of where it's coming from here in the Etruscan world is, is sort of unique. Oh, and don't forget, we have a Charon. We have a winged creature over here. Some people might say, well, gosh, that looks kind of like an angel, right? Well, we don't really see angels starting to show up until we get to late antiquity and early Christian art, right? But all of a sudden, we're seeing winged you know, Charon's here um, in this sort of polytheistic world, right? Um, so sometimes students find that interesting, that that you see angels on the scene before angels, you know, uh, uh, Christian angels uh, had, had really developed or existed in the iconography uh, yet in the, in the dogma of Christianity later. So I always find this fascinating. And then, of course, you know, some more examples here of just really intimate moments. This is the sarcophagus lid, so we're looking at the top of it, um, with a portrait of um, a couple, of two, two people. Um, and they are embracing one another um, in their afterlife. And you can see now, what is the Roman influence now? Well, we're starting to see more realistic or veristic, very realistic portraiture starting to come in to play. Um, very personalized, very naturalized um, uh, expressions on the face. And we will see more of that when we get to the Roman, to Roman world, um, but this is a, a, a nice little parallel here, a little teaser for you to understand how Etruscan art really is becoming Roman. And then Aule Metele, the arena tour. Um, so the arena tour is uh, basically he's a public speaker. And he's, the actual statue is made in an Etruscan workshop, but he is dressed very Roman. His actual clothing, right, with the toga and the Roman sandals. It's very Roman. His, his actual, you know, veristic features are very Roman. Um, there is an inscription at the bottom of his cloak, and the inscription's actually in Etruscan. Um, and it 
includes both his name as well as his father's name and his mother's name. Again, showcasing the importance of the woman, right? The woman as well as the man, your mother and your father in the Etruscan society. So again, we've got an Etruscan statue, an Etruscan inscription, the emphasis on the Etruscan mother and father, but he's dressed like a Roman. <laughs> so um, just fascinating to see the fusion there. Uh, and of course, he is located there um, in the Archaeological Museum actually in Florence, Italy. If you ever uh, get to go there to check that out. And it's kind of an interesting to scale comparison here um, to see kind of how enlarged the hand is um, in his gesture. And that really, I think, also speaks to the Etruscan uh, sensibility as well. The, the Romans later would make that more in proportion, right? But that, um, that's a perfect example. Okay, guys, well, uh, I think that that concludes the lecture, and I had a lot of fun with you today and I look forward to talking with you guys soon.